Yeah. Hey, um, I'm going to change my prepared remarks just a little bit because Carissa gave a such a great conversation. Um, you guys are probably going to be surprised. I'm not using any slides, so we're just going to have a conversation for the time that we have available. But if you look in the chat, there is a national initiative for cybersecurity careers and studies that an organization at the government of the United States has put together. And the reason that I bring it up, some of the questions in the chat focused on, you know, what are the skills? What are the knowledge areas? What are the abilities that people need to be successful in security? And one of the things that was highlighted in my biography was that I do spend time working to develop the talent and the abilities of people at all levels of the profession. So it's entry level, it's senior level, but for those of you who, regardless of what you do, whether you're an engineer, an analyst, if you want to be a chief information security officer, this is going to be a good resource because it allows you to identify everything that you need to know to be competent and capable to perform whatever the job duty is. So when you go to the website, the way that they've organized it, they have categories and specialty areas that help consolidate everything. But there are 33 specialty areas that identify 52 work roles. And so it would be very difficult to not find a detailed description of a real job that people want to do. The work role that I fulfill is executive cybersecurity leadership. So for those of you who want to be a chief information security officer or a senior executive, you now have a roadmap that allows you to look at all of the requirements you know what are the tasks for that job what are the skills what are the knowledge areas and what are the abilities and for people that i do coaching for their first homework assignment is to look at the work role to document all of the items that are listed and then just do a self-assessment am i a beginner am i intermediate or am i advanced for all of the knowledge abilities tasks skills that are listed for the position and from that information you can start to identify these are the gaps that i have for a specific work role that i want so if i want to be an executive but i have no background in strategy you know, I said that I was advanced in all of the technical capabilities, all of the engineering capabilities, all of the traditional cybersecurity skills, but I don't have any leadership skills. It allows you to identify where to focus, which addresses some of the questions that were in the chat after our great opening keynote that says, well, now I can self-assess the gaps that are in my skill set and then start to work to address those on my own so that when an opportunity becomes available, I'm in the best position to be successful. And so I'll leave you with that. I thought it would be a good way to start the conversation. The rest of the conversation, I generally don't use slides because you guys end up focusing on the slides. You don't look at me as not as engaging. And so we'll do it differently for this, but I have some prepared remarks. What I encourage you to do is post any questions that you have in the chat and I'll be happy to address those. And then we can always follow up and connect at some other time in the future if that's something that you're interested in. Now, I mentioned in my opening remarks, even just referring to the link that I posted, that I do a little bit of development. And so one of the reasons that also contributes to, not, to me not using slides is that there's a program called Developing the Leader Within You that is part of a training that I do for business executives. And there are some intellectual property protections that prevent me from, you know, posting the slides from that training online, but the content is still valuable and makes for a great conversation. And so if you think about digital transformation and the theme of the conference and looking at the growth of the cybersecurity market, not only on the African continent, including all the countries, but looking at the growth of the cybersecurity market globally, we're talking about an industry that covers maybe eight to ten trillion dollars worth of technology investment types of solutions types of approaches and so there's a lot that can be done there are a lot of opportunities for people to be successful and to identify where do you fit as an individual inside this marketplace that has room for everybody everywhere in the world 
um, if we go back to the beginning, the internet came to life in the early 1990s as engineers installed fiber, routers, and other infrastructure. And Checkpoint VPN1 was released as the first commercially available firewall in 1994. The design goals for that firewall were communications, not security. And so for the last 25 years since then, as we have been growing as an industry and as a practice, security really was a control function within organizations that was meant to prevent authorized access. Now, you know, in 2021, almost in 2022, the profession has numerous practices, approaches, and concerns. And so for the people that posted, you know, where do I begin or how do I add value if I'm not a technical person, security operations, compliance, risk management, network security, cloud security, all of those components of the profession really do open the door for everybody, regardless of your background or where you're starting, to have an opportunity to be successful. What it really comes down to is mastering the skill set that is going to be required for the position that you want to work in. And so similar to Carissa, um, some of my favorite employees are not technical people, uh, even though I started off in telecommunications and I did routing and switching and bridge network connections over ISDN. I have not been a official technical cybersecurity person for at least 10 years. What that means is that I've just spent a lot of my focus and a lot of my time on other concerns. And Malcolm Gladwell has a great book that's called Outliers from 2008. And inside the book, he says that people are, are not born geniuses, they get there through effort. So inside his book, he has a 10,000 hour rule that said it's the magic number of greatness. Um, one of the challenges with the 10,000 hour rule and where a lot of people start to argue with him and get confused is that you don't achieve greatness spending 10,000 hours of non-intentional effort. Like you can't passively go after mastering how to be a firewall engineer, or you can't passively go after mastering how to be a chief information security officer. It's 10,000 hours of focus and deliberate practice. And so then the next question begs, well, where do I learn how to practice? Part of that practice is going to start with identifying what it is that you really want to do. You know, are you going to be technical or are you going to be governance and leadership? And then from the technical and governance leadership decision, then you have to identify the specific areas that you're going to be in, which is the reason that I started with the link at the beginning of the presentation. Once you have identified the gaps that you have, the great opportunity that exists in modern times is that there are a lot of books there are a lot of authoritative sources. There's lots of free online training. And so for the question that talked about where do I find the training, you could become a competent cybersecurity professional only doing the LinkedIn learning that's available because some of the best leaders in the world have shared and donated their time and their energy to describe how do you do specific things. Some of my friends have done the LinkedIn learning sessions as instructors, and they've talked about everything from organizational leadership to digital transformation to cyber security leadership. And so there are great opportunities for you to learn, even if you don't go to university, even if you don't get the 50,000 certifications that are available in the profession. Ultimately, what a business is going to care about, especially if you're in a leadership position, is can you deliver the product, service, or result that the organization is looking for? And can you manage the team that produces the outcome? And so if you want to be in leadership, Managing teams becomes very important, but security certifications aren't going to help you with that. What you're going to need is experience working with people and understanding individual psychology and understanding how to build and manage relationships, sometimes among people who don't like each other or who don't work well together. Now, the other thing that becomes important is that you really have to understand the business that you're supporting. And so one of the items that I teach when I talk to CISOs is that you have to understand deeply and intimately the interests and the activities and the priorities of the organization that you're supporting. So if you work in oil and gas, the way that oil and gas operates as an industry is very different than the way that a financial services organization would work or a telecommunications company would work or even a software as a service company would work. And so understanding how the business works you know, how do they deliver their products and services? How do they go to the marketplace? Who are their competitors? There are a lot of things that are underlying business information 
that you need to develop knowledge, skills, and abilities in so that when you're speaking to your non-technical business counterparts, you can frame the conversation and the ideas in your remarks in a context that's relevant and appropriate for them. And so it leads into reading. You know, one of the things that happens with leadership, especially when you're focusing on digital transformation and just change within organizations is understanding the non-technical things that all the other leaders within the organization are familiar with. And so some of my favorite books are have nothing to do with cybersecurity and are often things that are overlooked. Um, one of the books, and this goes back to our opening keynote, is a book called Lynchpin by Seth Godin that focuses on the idea that regardless of your title or your position within the organization, you have the ability to lead because leadership is all about influence. You know, when I started my career, one of the reasons that I was able to be a CISO is because I was very good at getting things done just as a security analyst and as a security engineer, because I was able to drive change or drive action or produce some kind of result. And over time, that consistent outcome where results were regularly produced allowed me to have opportunities to have more responsibility. With more responsibility comes more influence. And then after many, many years, I'm was just allowed and blessed to be in a position where I ran an entire security program instead of being a person who contributed to the program. Now, one of the things that comes along with that is also understanding how businesses work in business conversation. So finance and accounting for non-financial managers is one of my other favorite books because it helps me to understand how money works within the business because that's really what the business people care about. You know, are we um, achieving our profit and loss goals? Are we achieving our revenue goals? Are we producing the outcomes financially that the organization was created to produce? One of the challenges that security people generally have is that most of their conversations are focused on technology or compliance, or they're focused on things that are very relevant to our profession, but are not the most exciting things for non-technical business people. And so if you allow my pause, I'm just typing in the chat. Um, Lynchpin by Seth Godin is a great book. And then Outliers by Malcolm, I can't spell this morning. Gladwell was the other book. And then any search on financial management is gonna lead you to a good book. Um, finance for non-financial managers is one of the books that I prefer, but my major in school at university started off as accounting before I switched it to information systems, but even academically, both of my degrees, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree are business degrees. I use those degrees in conjunction with security certifications and security training to be equipped to combine both and kind of create my own path for success. Now, I said this earlier in the conversation, but just to reiterate, one of the things that people often overlook about leadership, not cybersecurity leadership, but just leadership in general, is that leadership is all about influence. And so when you start to break it down, influence as a noun is just the capacity to have an effect on the character, the development, or the behavior of someone or something or the effect itself. And so it's a good definition, just going back to basics, when you think about what security people do, because everything that we're doing has an effect on the business, whether the business is successful and whether the business accomplishes its goals. And so when you think about what you normally hear in security training or in your certification, that the only thing that security people are really doing is confidentiality, integrity, and availability, it really comes down to context. What is the context and the business that you support that relates to the importance of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so if I work in an organization that has a lot of personal information, well, confidentiality becomes important because we have to protect that information by using your encryption. Or if I work in a um, hospital, the integrity of the data is going to be important because we wanna make sure that the data is accurate and appropriate, especially if we're dealing with patient information about drug interactions or previous procedures that have been done on the patient because you don't want to give them something that they're allergic to or something that is going to harm them. So just the integrity of data in the context of delivering health services 
helps make the conversation much more relevant to the stakeholders who care about what you're doing or who care about the product or result that you're delivering. And so the, with, to think about, as we transition to the end of the time that I have, is that there are lots of ways to evaluate your influence on the organizations. Part of that consideration is how you influence people and how you influence people will determine how many people, how long and how effectively you can influence them. And so the right way is to do influence through exchange, through persuasion and through respect. I'm sure that many of you have worked for leaders that use force, intimidation, manipulation and their position or their title to get the results that they're looking for. But the question that most people ask from their leaders are, do you care for me? Can you help me? And can I trust you? If the answer to all three of those questions is yes, you're much more likely to be a person of great influence where everybody is going to follow you and you accomplish good results. Leaders do their best to build trust by just being consistent, by having their work and their action line up with each other and by being dependable. Part of that dependability and part of that trust comes from the approach that you use to drive the team that works for you. So how many you influence also sometimes becomes a factor. If you're only influencing one or two people, you might be the boss, but you're not really a leader. If you influence the entire organization, that's more representative of the impact that you're making, especially as the organization is changing, because now people come to you, they seek your advice, they seek your wisdom, they seek your counsel, and they're looking for you to provide information that they need to become successful. Um, one of the questions that I have in the chat, because I think the chat is more important than my pre prepared remarks was just how have your colleagues influenced your behavior? I think the um, if I reflected on that today, I spend the most time with CEOs and board members because I've been doing a lot of training for boards of directors. I serve on a board of directors and I do advice in my professional services work to boards and I have had a ton of influence from hanging out with non-technical business people. Um, you know, most people assume that the board is this mysterious group of people that are inaccessible and are very difficult to connect with and talk to. And in reality, most of the people that serve on a board of directors are experts in some area or domain, but they admit in advance that they don't know everything. And so it's been very interesting to spend a lot of time with chief financial officers and chief executive officers and chief operating officers, because the things that they bring to the table are very different than the things that I bring to the table. But with all of our energy and all of our insight and all of our experience together, we produce very good results for the organizations that we support. Or when I go in as an advisor, they're as interested in what I have to say as I'm interested in the feedback that they have. Now, um, for the mentoring ship part, one of the cool things that happens is that you have a global network of mentors and coaches and other people who are willing to share their wisdom and their knowledge and their experience. Um, if you go to class-llc.com and put in CCL, I started a program that is actually available to everybody everywhere. If you decide to show up where we're just giving away cybersecurity wisdom and leadership. I have guest speakers and all kinds of other people who come by. We used to do it weekly, but we shifted to doing it monthly. But we just have a monthly topic that is complementary, that exists to advance knowledge and wisdom and education for people. And so if you give me just a moment, I'll bring that site up. I'll post a link in the chat. You can register, you can look at the recordings from some of the other videos, but there's no cost involved. And so out of respect to our sponsors, the only things that I'll talk about are things that are free because the sponsors have invested a lot of energy and we wanna make sure that we drive you to what they have available. The item that I posted in the chat is just free and it's purely educational and there are no strings attached whatsoever. Um, going back to my prepared remarks, because I don't see any other questions, um, one of the other things to consider when you talk about influence is why do you influence? You know, I spend a lot of time in Christian ministry, and so that also influences my approach and the way that I do things, but your motives are often crucial. And so from a faith perspective, my motives, I strive for them to be pure and for the greater good and to just add a benefit to the world. 
but why you do something ultimately determines what you do. And so when you think about the access to information and the impact that security people have on organizations, it's often very important that your security leaders, regardless of their role in the organization and regardless of the level in the organization, have good ethical behavior and have a good and stable situation going on in their own lives so that they're not trying to leverage their access to information for personal gain or so that they're not taking the access that they have to personal information of millions of people and then using that and selling it on the dark web and then your chief information security officer is the source of your insider attack you do want to make sure that you have good motives leadership functions should be based on trust and continual wrong motives and bad character are not going to lead to the best outcomes for people personally or lead to the best outcomes for the organizations that support them. And so if we start to summarize this with the time that I have remaining, there are really just a couple of keys to effective leadership if you're taking notes. Um, one item is just prioritize effectively. One of the things that I've seen a lot of CISOs do, and I think um, by this time I have personally trained about 1500 chief information security officers around the world in the last five, six, seven years. And very many of them find themselves running around like chickens on fire, responding to every new emergency that pops up with no prioritization. And so the idea about prioritizing effectively is very important because there is a difference between urgent and important. And so thinking about working smarter and having a higher return and understanding that you can't have it all. And when you start getting into some of the financial books, most organizations have limited financial resources. And if I have limited financial resources, the most important thing that I can do is apply my limited resources to the areas of greatest impact within the organization. And so if you take something like a risk register that I assume most of the audience is familiar with or understands, my risk register could have a thousand items on it. I only have budget for a hundred items. It would be important from a prioritization perspective that we take the hundred most impactful items for the organization and address them instead of addressing things that are insignificant and inconsequential. And so developing the ability to talk about the things that are essential and the things that are imperative and all of the very, um, important words that drive a response from the business are going to be critical because you want to make sure that the business is investing properly in the right things. Now, some of the other items that that I had in my prepared remarks were very similar to our opening keynote. You know, you want to create positive change. You want to solve problems. You want to serve others. Your attitude matters. And so if you come to the table and you are in a have a good attitude and you're open to conversations and you're willing to work with people, even under difficult circumstances, that has a significant influence on the outcomes that are produced, especially if you're in a leadership position. Having self-discipline, you know, showing up on time, being consistent, and being somebody that people can count on has a significant influence. And then continuing to grow is important. Um, even for me, having um, two academic degrees and multiple certifications, I continue to read and consume everything that I can about the types of industries that I support. Um, I will probably never be a chief information security officer again, only because I like supporting multiple organizations in various industries. But regardless of what you're doing, there's always going to be an opportunity to continue to grow. My final item, because I see the clock, is that networking and developing good professional relationships also becomes valuable. The smartest CISOs that I know have a great uh, WhatsApp channel. And in their WhatsApp channel, they spend a lot of time solving problems together. So now I'm not really going to Gartner, I'm not going to industry analysts, but I'm going to other people who are doing the same work that I'm doing. The relationships that you have might be more important than any domain knowledge that you have, because I can always reach out to somebody. And so I've just been blessed to know, you know, if I look at my close circle of friends, they are the chief security officers and the chief information officers and some of the largest companies in the world. They have probably solved problems that I need to solve and reaching out to them is much more effective than trying to rebuild solutions from the beginning. 
I can pick up where they've left off. We can collaborate together and solve problems for multiple organizations simultaneously. Just make sure that you are connecting with the right people and developing real, genuine relationships and friendships because that's going to produce tremendous value at some point in the future. And there was um, a link for the program, the Certified Chief Information and Security Officer. I was one of the authors of that program. So obviously my opinion is biased. I think the program is fabulous, but it is offered in a lot of places. So I've taught, I have personally taught it in Johannesburg about five or six times over the years. There are lots of people teaching it. There's lots of um, access to it. But if you have any questions about anything that I've discussed in this session, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. And I thank you very much, Cephas, for the opportunity to be one of the speakers featured here today. Good afternoon, you're welcome, um, Ian. I see, um, I think we can have time for just one question. Um, I probably have touched on this uh, from your commentary, but um, Dr. Paula asks, how do you become a leader of influence? Um, how do you earn respect with the team? Uh, could you share some practical tips and uh, things to do as a leader? Yeah, you know, one of the, the, I think consistency, which was one of the things that I mentioned, and my prepared remarks is the most important thing that you can do. I'm sure everybody has worked for a person that says one thing and does very different things in practice and in actuality. And what that does is it destroys your credibility. If you're in a leadership position and you're credible and people trust you and they know what to expect from you, it is going to produce great results in your relationship as a leader with your team. And it is also going to produce great results in your relationship with the business that you're supporting. And I would, that is actual, those are facts, not things that I read in the book. And I see it very often because now I don't work as a CISO for a company. Um, for years, I was at the Centers for Disease Control. And so the CDC had a global health program. And so I ran their program, which is why I know a lot of things about what's going on in a lot of the um, countries in Africa and in Eastern, Europe and in Eastern Asia, because the Center for Global Health was focused on AIDS eradication in 31 countries. And so in 31 countries, you can be an effective leader because you're credible. You know, you show up in their time zone, awake, ready to work, and there to deliver value, not to um, take the resources. That credibility goes a long way to build trust. And then with the trust, it's much easier to be a good leader rather than just having the title and everybody is subject to your ideas and your opinions. 